This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Roja Shy. Hello, this is Roja, and this is a special series of uh, Musings of the Shy's episodes dealing with Silk Road. I have um, re-uploaded the first trilogy uh, discussing Silk Road, along with a new episode giving you the update, and then following up another series of shows that will deal with some of the ramifications. Um, one is Agents of Silk Road, which deal with the FBI and Secret Service and possibly another federal agent involved in the corruption of the Silk Road case. If you'll take a look at uh, decentralized marketplaces that have cropped up since the collapse of Silk Road, both on the dark web and on the clear web, if you will, uh, fungibility, dealing with the issue of the ramifications of coins that been, may have been utilized in the dark web or illicit sites, uh, whether it be ga- ga- gambling, porn, or um, the drug buys, primarily drug buys, uh, what that means for cryptocurrencies in general, but in particular with the blockchain spies for Bitcoin. And then the rise of privacy cash as a result of the collapse of not only Silk Road, uh, the de-anonymization of Tor, uh, the fact that there are these blockchain uh, spies um, on the blockchain. They're, they're tracking the, all the various different types of purchases people are making, but who's also actually making those purchase, um, purchases. And that will culminate um, basically the next two weeks of Musings of the Shy episodes, centering on the theme of, of Silk Road, fungibility of cryptocurrency, and the rise of decentralized marketplaces. Now on to the show. Hello, and my name is Hero Job Shibe, and this is Musings of a Shy Podcast, a Dogecoin peer-to-peer sharing economy show. And you are listening to This is episode 18, Cavete Empator. Let the buyer beware. This episode is going to be the first episode of a trilogy. I have decided to break down the Ross Ulbrich case, uh, the United States versus Ross Ulbrich, or otherwise known as the Silk Road case, or you may refer to as the Dread Pirate Roberts case into three parts. Uh, the first part is I'm going to cover the, the basic elements of the case itself, uh, what the United States government is charging Ross Ulbrich, uh, why he's being charged, uh, the different terms that are being um, bantered and talked about in the news that are associated with the case. The second part of this uh, episode is going to be dealing with the Silk Road in itself, and I will cover the timeline of its existence, as well as the timeline of both the Bitcoin itself and the Bitcoin price. And there will also be a little bit about Mt. Gox, because Mt. Gox has been brought up in association with the case. And the third episode, and the last part of this trilogy, is going to deal with the implications of the trial in itself, the charges uh, that are being charged against Ross Ulbrich, the type of charges that he that has been leveled at him, the legal president that will be set if he is convicted and most importantly uh, what it would have the the chilling effect that it may have on the internet in and of itself if he is convicted but before we get into the episode in itself i'm going to do a little bit of news and then a scam alert so here's the news This new story comes out of Coindesk, uh, written by uh, John uh, Southwest. Uh, basically, what this story is about is that 5,000 uh, Taiwan convenience stores have opened themselves up to being um, allowing Bitcoin to pay for uh, goods and services. It is through their local exchange called BitoEX. And uh, I have a link into the article, a link in the article uh, in the show notes. But basically, they break down how they were able to do this feat in bringing uh, these convenience stores uh, into the fold, into the into the Bitcoin market. So it was a great article to look up. Uh, another thing is that Pirate Bay, a site has gone up and it's piratebay.se. And it's basically has a little tag that says we are TBB, which is uh, we are 
the Pirate Bay, and it has a countdown clock on to when it is uh, possibly going to reopen up. There's a little pirate flag that's flagging around on the website, but a countdown has been issued into when Pirate Bay is going to uh, come back into the world again. Another thing is that the Bitcoin prices have plummeted and risen and plummeted and risen again. Uh, currently, at the time of the recording of the show, uh, one Bitcoin is $215.84. Uh, I have a link in the show notes about a wonderful little article about faces of bubble corrections and about investment. And it's a pretty much something that was designed for the overall market in itself, but it's something that you can apply to any kind of market phase on the different phases that uh, various markets go through. It's a, it's a wonderful little map and a breakdown in very simple terms about how the market works and about bubbles. Another thing is that in Reddit, in the crypto markets, uh, Econ Doge, Redditor Econ Doge, uh, wrote up a very wonderful um, article about uh, the Dogecoin community, about the economics of the Dogecoin community and how um, the different numbers break down from Doge to BTC, Doge to USD, our worth, our value, our high, volume, our highs and lows, and just a breakdown overall um, of basically mathematical accounting numbers about Dogecoin and how this individual uh, feels that there's a, a bit of optimism to look for for 2015. I'm just going to quote a little bit from the post. It's for 2015. Looking forward, I somehow optimistic. The initial supply has been mostly exhausted. So without added pressure on miners selling selling. This could mean higher prices if adoption picks up. Exchanges added Dogecoin or Bitcoin prices recover. Internally, I believe developers will keep the network and client up to date and running, although there seems to be little interest in to uh, innovate. So we will have to see if just being a tipping cryptocurrency with a great community is enough to keep Dogecoin relevant. As for the price, there are a lot of unknowns, and as I mentioned now, that most of the coins have in mind, we could see some more volatility in the busy days, followed by sideway tra- trading like it is happening right now. Targets make little sense. So for now, I think our floor is the 20s. He's referring to the price in 20 Satoshis. The upside will depend on how much discount or on valuation is given to both Bitcoin and Litecoin. So far, we're around 2,000% discount versus Litecoin alone. So it's just a little nice little numbers thing. If you're into numbers about Dogecoin, I will have a link in the show notes about it. Um, as a little bit of a follow-up, buying Redico with any digital currency without leaving Reddit is now possible, which is made by possible by Redditor. Uh, Hill DB. Uh, he is a, a Doge bot uh, that was created called Coin Gold Bot, and basically you will be able to purchase uh, Reddit Gold with any cryptocurrency right now. Uh, right now there is a Reddit Gold with Dogecoin, which was created by you, uh, you user uh, Mulan who is the creator of the Doge tip bot on Reddit and Twitch. Uh, but as of now, there is now a uh, another uh, tip bot out there that accepts any cryptocurrency for the purchase of Reddit gold. And in the news and the subject of our uh, episode, uh, the, the trial for Ross Ul- Ulrich, the United States versus Ro- Ross Ulrich, uh, began this week on Tuesday, January 13th uh, in the state of New York at the, the federal court in, in, in New York City. Uh, there will be more on that. Uh, but before we get into uh, the episode itself, we have a bit of a uh, cryptocurrency scam alert. Uh, as of right now, Crypto Double was a site that had promised that within 100 hours, your investment of Bitcoin would be done. Doubled, hence the title of the, the website. Um, all related websites, uh, Facebook and Twitter pages seem to be deactivated at the moment in time. But uh, the latest scam, this particular scam in itself, has absconded with at least uh, 2,300 or 2,200 uh, BTC or about $500,000 of BTC has been cashed out on the exchange BTCE, uh, basically leaving uh, thousands of customers out of pocket. Uh, it's a scam again that promised to double people's money which is something that people need to be cautious of because it was something that was guaranteed um, in a short amount of time with very little or no explanation Uh, but as of now this is uh, something that is has occurred it's being reported on Uh, there is efforts to launch a class action suit no doubt that the sec and any government bodies have have been informed or complaints have been made and so this is going to be an ongoing another ongoing uh, scam scandal within the cryptocurrency 
But if you're somebody that has have had some funds on Crypto Double, um, you're not getting that back. They're gone. But it's I have a link in the show notes. And it's just uh, you should click on the article and read about it just so you can have some self-awareness about the different types of scams that are out there. And to do a bit of more research and making sure that uh, the individuals that you're doing business with are legitimate, that everything is the up and up. Um, it's OK to ask questions. It's OK to email people uh, to check up on business licenses if there if such business license exists uh, to ask around to put post questions in either big bitcoin uh, uh bitcoin um our Bitcoin or Bitcoin talk and talk to people or go through as many different uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency related pages that are out there, websites, and just ask questions and ask people, you know, what is this particular site all about? How is this happening? And you're going to find answers very quickly on whether or not this is something you should be doing. So again, just a little bit of a scam alert. Uh, Crypto Double is a Bitcoin scam that has absconded with at least uh, 2233 BTCs, about $500,000 worth of money, and it's cashed out and that money is gone uh, basically and has left a lot of uh, customers in a lurch. Uh, they've sconed with the, f- the funds. Um, there's talk about putting a class action lawsuit against the company and tracking down the owners and no doubt um, as this, as this story develops there will, there will be some form of a regulatory or criminal proceedings uh, against these individuals. Okay, so that is it for the news. Now on to the episode at hand. So on this first part of the episode of this trilogy, I'm just going to lay out the basic elements of the case and break down break it down into six points or six terms uh, that you should be aware of. You should be aware of what is being discussed in the case and who Ross Ulbrich is and what Silk Road is and Tor and Deep Web and what is going on. So you can follow along on this case because this case is very important. It's not just necessarily just about drugs or Bitcoin or any of that. It has it does have have some ramifications on the internet as a whole and as individuals within the United States. So first off, uh, basic facts. The United States government is versus Ross William Ulbrich. Uh, the judge is Catherine Foster. It's taking place uh, at the federal courthouse in New York City, New York. The prosecutor, I could not find any information on the lead prosecutor, but the defense is, the defense lawyer is Joshua Dutrell. The accounts against Ross Ulbrich are trafficking drugs on the internet, narcotics trafficking conspiracy, computer hacking conspiracy, Money and laundering conspiracy, and then six uncharged crimes of m- murder for hire. This is what he has. He has these uh, crimes that uh, these uncharged crimes are something that the even though the prosecution has not had the evidence or the ability to indict him on these uncharged crimes, they still can bring it up in, in the court. So he has six uncharged crimes of murder for hire, and so those are the basic elements of the case. Uh, Ross Ulbrich has pled not guilty. The trial started January thirteenth of this year. It is expected to go on for. For six weeks. So these are the, these are the seven points I want to bring up about this case and trying to break down what is going on or the elements that are being discussed in the case so you you can be properly informed. Uh, the first point is what is Silk Road? Uh, Silk Road, and this is something that Ross Oberch has admitted to doing, was a marketplace, a black it was an online black marketplace, best known for you know selling illegal drugs. It is part of what is called the Tor Hidden Services, and I'll explain what Tor is. And basically. What it was it was a marketplace set up in the similar fashion that a Craigslist or any eBay or any of those type of online services that sell goods and services online for the purpose of selling goods and services with the ability to purchase these goods and services with Bitcoin. So if you were to access Silk Road through the Tor network and you wanted to purchase something on Silk Road, you would have to use Bitcoin to make a purchase. If you wanted to sell something on Silk Road, you would have to sell your goods and services for Bitcoin. And basically, it was a platform that was primarily used to sell narcotics. That was 70% of the selling base or the products that were being sold on the marketplace. It was established in February 2011 and eventually it was shut down by the FBI in 2000, October of 2013. So that is basically what Silk Road is. Uh, there has been other websites that have developed based on the concept of using Tor as a means to sell drugs on the marketplace or create a online service that sells goods and services on the marketplace with Bitcoin as one of the primary means of purchasing these items. Uh, there's also been other Silk Roads that have been created. After the initial shutdown by the FBI and the seizure, uh, seizing of servers that that Silk Road operated on. It was relaunched again in November of 2013. It was called Silk Road 2.0. That has also been shut down. It was shut down last year in November of 2014. And there has been 
other dark web or dark net sites that have developed uh, since the creation of Silk Road, since the collapse of Silk Road 2.0, that has entered in the marketplace to do the, basically the same thing that Silk Road has done, which was selling primary drugs, but all types of goods and services that could have been bought on the site with the purchase of Bitcoin. So that is Silk Road. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit about what deep web is, because it's something that is brought up a lot in association with Silk Road and Tor. Basically, what the deep, deep web is, is the ability for websites, forums, anything that is on the internet to not be easily searched. So basically when you have a website name, for example, www.ebay.com. In order to access a website, for example, if eBay was on the deep web, you would have actually have to know the exact address. You would have to know that it was www.ebay.com in order to access it. You couldn't search it through your regular brow- browsers like a Internet Explorer, Firefox, you know, Chrome. Any web browser out there would not, or Google, would not easily readily pick it up. A lot of times these type of web search sites Browser sites deliberately don't allow access to Tor sites, and I'll get into what Tor is or these deep websites uh, because of their a lot of times because of legality, but other times because of the manner upon which the individuals set up the website so they would not uh, you can directly access it, and that's pretty much what deep web is. Um, it's not primarily used for illegal purposes, even though it it has been used for illegal purposes. A lot of times, the reason why people use Tor or these type of deep web uh, services is so that they can protect their information. Uh, a lot of times, like reporters or activists live in countries where if they speak out against their government or companies or certain individuals, they're subject to being put in prison, being killed, uh, being sought after, having their lives being threatened. So you have a lot of private individuals that utilize the tools associated with the dark web. And I want the biggest thing is Tor, and they they utilize that type of service to protect their identity. Now, there are other types of services out there that operate on the deep web, but we're just going to talk about primarily Tor because that's what Silk Road used. So what is Tor? Tor is something that, first off, the United States government developed. So before you, you know, you hear this on the, on the news a lot about Tor being associated with dark web and illegal out, you know, illegal activities, you know, everything from drugs to child porn to terrorism. You have to understand something that the tour was developed by the United States government, particularly by the U.S. Navy. And the reason why they developed tour is for the sole purpose of protecting information, particularly intelligence communications. So tour was developed, again, it was developed by the, the U.S. Navy. It came out of DARPA. Uh, DARPA is a big think tank of the United States government. A lot of significant ideas, concepts, uh, hardware, a lot of uh, the particular electronics equipments and ideas that you currently use in the world right now, a lot of it has come out of DARPA in some shape or form. And basically what it did was it was just a means of keeping communication safe on the internet. That was the primary reason. And Tor in itself is an acronym called the Onion Routing Project. It was launched um, in September of 2002 and has been open to the public pretty much from the get-go. Uh, the U.S. Navy still, uh, it, in 2004, it released the code for Tor under free license. Uh, Electronic Frontier Freedom began funding Tor in itself because Tor is a non-profit organization as well as a program. And it's used by the U.S. Navy, again, is used by journalism, is used by a lot of people. It's not just for illegal activity. And I'm going to break down who who uses TOR, because I think it's very important when people uh, discuss TOR and what it is and the concept of TOR, they have to understand it's, it's just a tool. And like any tool, it can be used for the purposes of good or the purposes of bad, depending on who's using it. And I don't necessarily mean bad as an evil, but it could be like if you're hammering a piece, a nail to a piece of wood, you can do it either well or you can do it, you know, god awful. Again, it is not the fault of the nail or the hammer or even the piece of wood. It's it's all about the human who operates these different types of tools. Also, it's important to know that uh, Tor, the nonprofit organization responsible for the Tor code and the Tor project, they received a lot of grants from the United States government still, even including private funding. And 60% of his funding comes from the State Department and the Department of Defense. So before, you know, when you get in these discussions and people talk about how it's an evil thing or it's, you know, used for illegality, it's funded by the United States government. So it can't be something that's completely awful or bad if it's being used by the U.S. government. It's not being shut down completely, even though there 
there has been crackdowns on the torn torn itself through criminal proceedings but that's the end of the rant there um so who uses tor uh i'm gonna read this straight from the uh Guardian article, which was written by Stuart Dredge, and it came out November of 2013. Uh, the Tor project team says that users fall into four main groups. Normal people who want to keep their internet activities private from websites and advertisers, uh, those concerned about cyber spying, cyber spying, and users invading censorship in certain parts of the world. So again, journalists and activists, my little interjection in here, they don't want anyone to know what they're doing on the internet. They want to be able to freely discuss and communicate from person to person without fear of reprisal. Uh, the United States military still uses TOR as a means of communication. So um, continuing from the article, uh, TOR notes that the technology is used by military professionals. The U.S. Navy is still a key user, as well as activists, journalists, and countries with strict censorship of media and the internet. Uh, campaigning body re- reporters without borders advises journalists to use TOR, for example. Uh, TOR also cites bloggers, business executives, IT professionals, and law enforcement officers as key users, with the latter including police needing to mask their IP addresses when working under cover online or investigating questionable websites and services. For more mainstream users, it can mean running tours so that their children's location can't be identified when they're online, or it could be mean a political activist in China, Russia, or Syria can, Syria can protect their identity. And after the NSA surveillance revelations in 2013, a new wave of users joins the service between August of 19 and August of 27 alone. The number of people using Tor more than doubled to 2.25 million. According to Tor's own figures, before peaking at nearly 6 million in mid-September, it sits back to slip back to just over 4 million. So, is it so while Tor is out there, um, out there on the interweb, it is not something that's so widely used. I mean, 4 million people, um, I'm sure there's some knockoff Facebook app or Snapchat app or even just a little gaming app that has more users than people who use Tor. Now, what exactly Tor is, is basically the, the purpose of Tor, the way, the why it was developed, is it developed again out of the, the U.S. Navy, a U.S. government project to mass communications, to prevent anybody from directly accessing the information through through the internet. It masks IP addresses, it masks uh, websites, it masks any information from e- easily being traced and tracked down. And that's and how they do this is by creating a software program called Tor and using what is called relays. These Tor relays is what you access when you have the software program and you activate it and you're searching online. You go through these relays that are scattered throughout the world. And it's from these relays that you're able to mask your IP address, your uh, website, if you choose to use um, Tor as a means of hosting your website and prevent anyone from tracking your your information. So basically, that's what um, Silk Road was. Was is was one of these websites that was hosted on the Tor network, where you could only access it through the the Tor software, through the Tor browser. And knowing the uh, Silk Road address, you would be able to through the Tor software program get on to the Tor network and access Silk Road. It was not something that was readily or easily found and deliberately so on the internet. So that is what Tor is. Uh, another aspect that's being brought up in this case is drugs. Drugs were, according to all accounts, were 70% of the business on on Silk Road. And they primarily were illegal drugs, but not exclusively so. And depending on your location in the world, that that drug could be illegal or legal within that within that country. Silk Road was a, a global website. It had buyers and sellers around the world selling goods and services uh, through Silk Road to anyone and everyone. But the reason why, again, the reason why Ross Ulbrich is facing these charges is because Silk Road was primarily u- utilized as a marketplace for the purpose of, of selling drugs, primarily illegal drugs, to people to people around the world. And how they were able to pay for these drugs and services was the use of Bitcoin. You could only purchase and buy items on Silk Road with the use of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, what it is, is the cryptocurrency that was developed by Satoshi Nakamoto. 
Uh, Bitcoin uses peer-to-peer technology to operate with no central authority or banks to manage the transactions. Bitcoin has a monetary value. It goes up and down depending on the markets. Um, it's open source, so the public has easy access to it. No one no one entity or person controls a Bitcoin. And this was the means or the payment service of, service upon which uh, Silk Road uh, chose, to, chose to receive not only its commissions from sales on the site, but for its vendors and and buyers to use Bitcoin as a means of payment. Now, Ross Ulbrich um, has openly admitted that he created Silk Road, the marketplace, that he developed it. But his contention and his defense is that he gave up control of Silk Road within six months of his creation and that he is not the pseudonym, the online pseudonym, the Dread Pirate Roberts, who um, managed Silk Road. He had that he had given up that identity and that he was not that individual. So let me explain to you who Ross Ulbrich is. Uh, he is, um, as he's openly admitted to doing in uh, in his defense, the creator of Silk Road. He he is 30 years old. Uh, he's from Austin, Texas. He has a bachelor's degree in science from, in physics and a graduate degree in education from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State University. This is something that I'm reading from his LinkedIn page. Uh, he also, at one point in time, was the CEO of a nonprofit organization called Good Wagon Books. Good Wagon Books basically took uh, reusable reasu- item- items found um, in homes and then redistributed them to various charities, uh, to basically nonprofit charities like Inner City Youth programs, programs, uh, prison, prison literacy program um, within the state of California. And he is, um, as he, he's openly admitted to being the creator of Silk Road. He states that he is not the pseudonym Red Pirate Roberts, the owner and manager of the online marketplace Silk Road, as the United States government is alleging that he is. And he's the man who's facing trial for the crimes that the government has placed charges on him. So that's basically Ross Albridge. There's not much known about Ross Albridge. I mean, I will have a link to his defense site, Free Ross. But he just seems to be a very young, very smart man that had an idea that uh, of creating uh, the Silk Road marketplace to utilize cryptocurrencies as a means of payment. And it just went from there. I'm just kind of just sticking to the facts here. Now, I've mentioned Red Pirate Roberts a few times. It, the pseudonym comes from the character of the Princess, the Princess Bride, and Dread Pirate Ry- Roberts is the the pseudonym that the United States government states that Ross William Ulbrich was. But basically, the Dread Pirate Roberts is the individual that managed the marketplace and was administrator of Silk Road. He had the primary control of the website in and of itself. Uh, he made he basically said yes or no to who, to the vendors that come on, to any of the additional help that he, that may have been received on Silk Road. The different from individuals that may operate the support structure, uh, the customer, whether it be the software support, the hardware support, the server support of Silk Road, to the chat support, customer service support, anything and everything necessary to keep a um, website going. Dread Pirate Roberts was responsible for, and there's a significant amount of chat logs from the internal Silk, Silk Road servers to uh, public chat, lo- chat logs of an individual going by the name of Dread Pirate Roberts talking about Silk Road and speaking to individuals about Silk Road itself. And some of these chats even go as far as, as talking about these murder for hire charges or uncharges that uh, Ross Ulbrich is facing. Um, again, uh, the United States government is alleging that Dread Pirate Roberts is Ross Ulbrich. Ross Ulbrich, in his defense, is alleging that it's not only, not only him, but it's completely somebody else. And the, the final two points of the Ross Albridge case is the one charge I didn't mention in the beginning, which is the Kingpin statue. The Kingpin statue is a charge called the Continuing Criminal Enterprise. And basically what this charge is, is that the law is applied to any criminal organization with six or more members organized by a single leader. In this case, because the United States government is alleging that Ross Albridge is the Dread Pirate Roberts, the individual running Silk Road Marketplace, and that Silk Road was a criminal organization organization it was a criminal enterprise uh the key is the kingpin and therefore he can face with just this charge alone up to 30 years if convicted just on this charge if he's convicted um with the other charges it's just you know it's his additional add all the other charges don't particularly matter he's just going away basically for life and this has to do with a simple concept or legal concept called transfer in, of intent and transfer intent is used when a defendant intends to harm one victim but they unintentionally harm a second 
second victim. In, case, in this case, the defendant's intent transfers from one intended victim to the actual victim and being used to satisfy the mens rea element of the crime that the defendant is being charged with. The transfer intent doctrine is only used for completed crimes, is not used for attempted crimes. And mens rea means uh, the criminal intent, the state of mind of, the in, of indicating culpability, which is required by the statute of element of crime. So the state of the mind of the crime. So basically, what makes these last two charges or points, the, the, the legal doctrine, doctrine of justifying the type of charges um, being levied against Ross Ulbricht, the transfer intent, and the kingpin charges, which is getting a lot of people, particularly those who are big ag- ad- advocates of freedom on the internet, is that because Ross Ulbricht created this silk marketplace roadside, and he created this market, this website for the purpose of, of selling goods, and it so happens that this marketplace did in fact sell illegal narcotics, even though he himself Self did not sell narcotics, did not direct individuals per se to, to sell drugs. Uh, he just ran the website. He had no hand in the actual drug activity. Uh, people are deeply concerned by this because it, it, it could send a legal, it will establish a legal precedent that basically you're responsible for your customer's actions. For example, on Craigslist, you can, if you look for it and know the right code words, you can, code words, you can find various um, prostitute, prostitutes or ladies of the night, if you will, on Craigslist advertising their goods, goods and services on um, through that site. Now, Craigslist could be held culpable for individuals using their website to advertise that type of illegal activity. Even though the intent of Craigs- Craigslist is to sell all types of goods and services, it just so happens that a customer of theirs utilize their services for illegal purposes. And this is what a lot of people are very up in arms about this case because they're they're deeply concerned by the fact that Ross, Ross Ulbridge is being charged with of the, with these crimes because of the actions of others, of act, the actions of his customers. And the, again, this can open up a whole liability issue. It can also open up the fact that a lot of different types of services would either shut down or become very restrictive. You would have to put up more information about yourself in order to utilize the service. For example, Craigslist might not no longer be free. You might have to pay through a credit card or debit card, uh, produce a photo identity before you can advertise that you're having a yard sale um, for your home for the sheer fact that Craigslist is afraid that even though you state that you're doing a yard sale at your home, it's not actually your home, it's somebody else's home and what you're selling are stolen goods. You know, Craigslist is not going to willing to take that chance. And there's other ramifications that can go beyond just that, you know, eBay or Amazon. Uh, individuals can, the, the, these uh, websites can be held for the fact that maybe bad products or false products could have been have to have and did and were sold on their website and they could be held culpable and there's also the the fact that he's being held on the kingpin status uh this seems to be a bit of an overcharge on the part of the united states government many individuals feel that this is extremely unfair particularly the the nature of silk road even though he has been charged not been charged but he there has been talk of the fact that he may or may not have done these murder for hire deals that there has not actually been any death or violence associated with so growth. In fact, there are studies indicating that through the use of so growth, violence in a number of different areas plummeted across the country, across across the country, because individuals no longer were meeting person to person. They're basically going online, paying through the use of uh, Bitcoin. Everything was anonymous. And then within a certain designated date or time, your your goods, your drugs were delivered delivered to you. And so it reduced the physical interaction. It reduced the the element of you don't have to, I don't have to know you. You don't have to know me. There's no possible way you could testify me or any of that kind of aspect or the criminal element. Also, the sheer fact because of drugs are typically, the purchase of drugs are typically a cash-based business. You're not going from one place to another carrying a large amount of cash in the fear of being robbed or anything like that or ripped off. 
So violence dropped and plummeted. And so there's a number of individuals that have a significant issue with the kingpin status and just this is charges against Ross Ulbricht in general. But for the internet purposes and for the purposes of a lot of people that believe in freedom, they're very deeply concerned by the nature of this prosecution and the fact that he developed this website. Um, it was utilized for the purposes of criminal activities and that he's being held accountable for it. And so there's a number of individuals and a lot of people that are watching this case because they're deeply concerned of the legal precedent that could be set if Ross Ulbricht is convicted. Now, on the U.S. government side of, side of things, why they feel justified in, in essence, what many people believe to be or perceive to be an overcharge, but why they feel justified in these charges is because what the Silk Road marketplace has demonstrated is something that the, whether you agree with the U.S. government's policies on, on drug enforcement or not, uh, what they have feared is that the internet would come into the drug marketplace more so than it already has. If a, as in the case of Silk Road marketplace is done, if an eBay style type of marketplace or the eBay of the drug market were to occur, there will be no means for them to properly inf- enforce the current drug laws. And the Silk Road marketplace had already, in essence, demonstrated that. And how they demonstrated that was the, through the use of Bitcoin as the primary means of payment for goods and services on Silk Road, but also the an- anonymity that Tor had offered for the Silk Road users and, and vendors and customers, basically. Uh, that they, this, These two combinations allowed and, and, and made for the eBay of the drug market. Marketplace. This is why you see a number of different types of deep web, dark market uh, drug sites that have since flourished uh, since the demise of both Silk Road 1 and Silk Road 2. But basically, because up to this point, even though drug transactions did in some ways occur on the internet, most of them was primarily communications, uh, which law enforcement has been successful in intercepting, uh, obtaining, you know, the various texts and texts and emails or however... Uh, uh, an individual may communicate through the internet, you could not, even if you wanted to, to really purchase drugs off the internet because credit cards and wire transfers are easily traceable, okay? Um, the government can just sit on a bank and get the warrants necessary and track the payments. Uh, what Bitcoin did was it provided the, the anonymity between the, the individual, the customer, and the buyer where the government was unable to easily and readily track the, that payment. They just weren't able to do so because there's no bank for them to sit on. And even if they were to sit on and watch the public ledger or figure out what someone's uh, Bitcoin address was, it, there's still the, the possibility of shifting and sorting through their addresses and and basically preventing the government from finding completely uh, the individuals behind different types of drug transactions. They would literally have to have the private key or the computer that the individual used to make these transactions in order for them to track it down. And that takes time and a lot of effort as the Silk Road case has demonstrated what it took was that they were able to embed an informant into the the Silk and the Silk Road infrastructure and that's how they were able to obtain a lot of information. But on the outside, it's not something they, they would easily be readily to do because again with Bitcoin, there is no bank for them to sit on. They can't sit on a bank and seek subpoenas and monitor accounts. It's not possible for them to do so. And because Tor allows for anonymity and the increase of encrypted communications, what Silk Road has demonstrated is it is possible to eBay the drug market. And this is why the U.S. government is coming down so hard on Ross Ulbricht is because they're trying to scare people and preventing them from creating marketplaces similar or unique or along the lines that Silk Road marketplace um, is. So this is where I'm going to end the episode uh, for part one of this trilogy on the uh, US, United States government versus the Ross William Ulbricht case or the Silk Road case. Uh, the second part of this episode is I'm going to go over the timeline of Silk Road from its inception until its demise because it ties a lot of what's happened to the Silk Road ties into uh, the price of Bitcoin, uh, the progress that Bitcoin had made in the years that uh, Silk Road was operational, as well as into uh, Mount Gox and the, the various Bitcoin exchange, exchanges that existed uh, at the time that Silk Road was operational. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.